What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Big Ten Show Iowa edition. And we are here with our guest, Jeffrey the Greek, as many of y'all may know him from the Eyes on the Big Ten pod. Probably seen him on Twitter. Um, you know, he knows his Iowa football, he knows college football in general. He's been doing this a while. So, um, Jeffrey, appreciate you stopping on here. And uh, Jeffrey, why don't you let the people know where they can find you and uh, you know, plug your stuff real quick? Yep. Uh, Twitter at Jeffrey the Greek at Jeffrey the Greek. I always screw that up. And then uh, if you pretty much follow me, you'll get the links to the Eyes on Big podcast. Uh, the Eyes on Big podcast. Also on Twitter, we don't do much uh, from the Twitter account, but the the podcast itself is on Apple and Spotify and all the good ones. Uh, so look us up. Yep. And uh, and uh, Sunny on the end, my co-host Sunny Verma down there in the end. Sunny, how you doing today, man? Doing good. Uh, I've been listening to the Eyes on Big podcast for a couple of years now, so I've gotten to meet Jeffrey a couple of times now. And, you know, I'm excited for this opportunity, but also being very careful. I am on the panel with a Nebraska fan and an Iowa fan, so I got to <laughs> you know, intervene and make sure I got to create some room between you two. Here. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Flip it. Nice. <laughs> No, but in, yeah, in today's episode, we're going to be going over the uh, Iowa offseason, getting to, you know, there's some of uh, the latest news on the uh, coaching staff changes. So we'll we'll jump right into that off rip and then we'll get into more from there. So. Um, so, yeah. So. So, Jeffrey, it's been, what, three months, uh, you know, with the uh, offensive coordinator opening roughly. Um, obviously, there's been names that are being bandied about uh, seemingly every couple of weeks. It's a new name and new you know, photos being taken of uh, Kirk going out to lunch or breakfast with uh, different candidates. And finally, they've made the hire of Tim Lester. Uh, from my observing, you know, Iowa fans don't exactly seem super excited about the hire. Uh, what are your thoughts? So if, if I could, I'll start with the first kind of thing you brought up. And then obviously I'll get into to Tim Lester. Um, so this this is like I believe a, 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 a important part to bring up because then it adds into the contention that's out there. So certainly the by by the uh, letter of the law, the Iowa offensive coordinator position has been open since the end of October. With that being said, there was a football season going on, and after KF had an initial dust up, you know, with the media because he was pissed okay i don't think it was i don't think that's you know anything that was hidden or anything like that pretty quickly after that that next tuesday he does his you know call in show he reiterated that he wanted to stay at iowa that he wasn't going anywhere he also said you know brian ferentz will remain in this role until the end of the season whether you know if that ends in a bowl or whatnot he also said that you know essentially my focus the football team end this season for now. I view the offensive coordinator search as an off-field, off-season situation. So I will get to that when the season is over. I believe this would be a disservice to the current members of the football team if I start looking for this position right now. Iowa made it to the Big Ten Championship, which means that he did not focus on hiring the offensive coordinator until after at the very earliest they got back from Indy. So I will pause right now and ask a, you know, two pretty rival, you know, fan bases, do you agree with Kirk Ferentz's approach and and what are your thoughts on how he handled it up to that point? I think Kirk how do I he lives by his own rules and so obviously with you, you know, establishing that, you know, we can tell that he wasn't happy that he was even forced to kind of make this decision. I think he just wanted to delay it as long as he can. And uh, at this point, he's been there so long that, you know, he's, when you think of Iowa football, you think of Kirk Ferentz. And I think that's probably the only way he could have done it. I, I just don't see him. He's so laser focused on game planning, doing this. I don't think he would have allowed himself to have a distraction of, going out for breakfast and lunches and interviewing other guys while there were still games to be played. Yeah. And I I'm, I'm with, I, I think just in terms of just being a, I, I think that's the right way to do it. I don't necessarily think, you know, I, of course, having a longer stretch of being able to look for a coach and, and, 
being able to get, you know, maybe a, a firm to get out and start outreaching to coaches, you know, like like they normally do during the season. But I, I think it was the right thing to do. Do I think it probably maybe would have set them up a little bit better if they would have, you know, held it out a little longer, stretched it out a little longer when they had a chance? Yes. But I think, um, like he said, I think Ferentz is just kind of doing it as his way. And and I, I think it was the right move personally. And and I'm not necessarily against the the move they made. And, but we'll get into that a little bit here in a second. But that that's my take on it. I think yeah. he did the right thing. So, Sonny, Justin, I appreciate the feedback from both of you. But, you know, so we have, you know, all three of us uh, that agree and, you know, only 33% of us are Iowa fans that his approach of waiting until the end of the season at least wasn't completely misguided. So mm -hmm. that kind of is my sneaky way of saying people that are saying this position's been open for 90 days are either trying to be trolls or they just do not understand the information that is at hand, Okay. He, the the posit, the search started in earnest after Indianapolis and before the bowl, which is like two weeks, okay? Yeah. In that time frame, he did get contacted and contacted a lot of people. There's some big names that I know about that called. This whole thing about does anybody want this position also is silly to me. I'm going to throw this out there. I think anybody wants any of an O and D coordinator position throughout the entire Big Ten. So I'm not even focusing here on Iowa. The amount of money that Illinois is going to throw at an offensive coordinator as compared to a head coach salary at Ohio or Western Michigan, to we are talking about doubling the money. I think fans think that, that every one of these coaches is just sitting on a pile of money and they're all set for life. Most of these people have grinded through a decade plus of sitting on couches, somehow getting a, a, a wife to agree to marry them when they were as poor as can be. They are now just getting into this money. I don't know what the salary is yet, but I'm guessing it's north of a million dollars or somewhere around there, a... a uh, Offensive coordinator in Ohio probably makes three three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we're talking about double, triple, quadruple the amount of money. Of course, there were people interested in the Iowa offensive coordinator position, folks. And I'm not saying you two. Use your brains. Use yep. any form of ability to grasp. Put yourself in the position of these people. There were people interested. I would also throw out there that the bar is set so astronomically low at the University of Iowa football program right now that you can roll over it as an offensive coordinator. If you come in and coordinate the 89th ranked offense, people might build a statue for you in year one in Iowa City or at least Coralville and North Liberty. You will be yep. loved. Those two positions alone, of course, they attracted people. What restricted the search was KF himself. For better or worse, I don't know. Uh, we will see how that all works out. But in my opinion, and then we'll get to the guy, okay? In my opinion, things in life, and certainly with a, with a college football program, perhaps don't look quite as awful as they look on the outside. And the reverse side of it, aren't they, things don't look quite as good as they could on the outside. What am I getting at? I believe Iowa's skill positions line running game is much closer to being good than people realize. I believe the schemes in the throw game put the Iowa offensive line and therefore rushing attack behind the eight ball way more than it should have along with injuries at quarterback and whatnot. Okay. So what I believe KF's approach to this was, I do not want to radically change everything about this offense in my program I want to continue on with um, a complimentary football. And as the joke goes, there hasn't been much to compliment with Iowa's defense or offense the past three years. Those jokes apply. Okay. <laughs> so with that, you know, being said, if we can tweak the throw game, which maybe not tweak, it might need to be overhauled. Okay. And then mix in maybe a little something like an RPO game at the line of scrimmage when you know you have seven or eight guys in the box all the time, okay? Tweaks and a different set of eyeballs on the offense, I believe is the more prudent path, 
for Kirk Ferentz and Iowa to go, as opposed to going to something radically different that that was got you know to 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 change things. We saw that last year in Wisconsin. If you need a very recent on field example, Wisconsin fans, people in the media were just like, "Here we go." Wisconsin's defense, this new offense, they are going yeah. to everybody picked them to win the 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 uh, uh, Big Ten West, except for us eyes on big. Why? Because we used our brains and said, this is an all new defense and offense yeah. in Wisconsin. Me thinks it will take a year or two for this to get down. I would apply that exact same th thought process to Iowa on why Kirk Ferentz doesn't want to drastically change under an offensive coordinator. Ryan Grubb was never an option. Maybe Tommy Reese, maybe Tommy Reese. Okay. But some of these names getting thrown out, we're not going to come to Iowa because I'm going to have a, a, a part of, of humility and honesty here because it's Iowa, but also because KF was keeping the parameters closer to something that he wants. Okay. Yep. Thank you for walking through that exercise. Please call me out on my audacity. If there's anything I've thrown out there, uh, I'm, I'm always willing to learn from, from my audience. No. It, oh, go ahead, Sonny. Go. I'll let you. Say, uh, what about Paul Christ? You know, that was a name that was commonly heard that, you know, hey, it's just a matter of time. They're just ironing things out. And then obviously he, you know, is staying with Texas uh, in that analyst role and I'm sure being paid handsomely for it. Um, what did you hear in the Hawkeye circles uh, in regards to him? Paul Christ was undoubtedly a huge candidate. And I believe were to the point where terms were trying to be agreed upon to bring Paul Christ in as the offensive coordinator. I believe these conversations happen between the Big Ten Championship and the bowl game. What went down during the bowl game, right around there, and directly after on why the deal was not made, I do not know. I, I'm, I'm guessing a very small collection of human beings know why. But I think I've got an information enough to say that something something was up. I don't think it was Paul Chris saying, gross, I don't want to go to Iowa. I don't know what that was. I would also say there's two things. I, I never was convinced, and I publicly stated this, of Paul Chris as a, a recruiter. I don't believe him or Chip Kelly want to recruit. I don't think they want anything to do with that. I got an issue with that as the leader of the offense. I need that person selling not only the offense, but the program. Also, I don't want a dirty badger as my offensive coordinator. I'm just going to throw that out right now. He didn't just coach there. He played there too. So there was two reasons right there that I did not lose a, a, a half hour of sleep over Paul Chris not coming. Then I got anxious a little bit, truth be told, like, you know, let's, who are we going to get? Let's get this thing. So now we move yeah. into the social media experiment that has gone on the past 10 days. All right. Yep. And, and following Nebraska fans on Twitter and following Illinois basketball fans on Twitter, y'all don't have anything to say because we've all been in these situations before. All right, just going to throw that out there as a preemptive strike. So I have no idea why Kevin Johns became the absolute, this is the guy that we want candidate, but he yeah. got there. It, it, I think it mostly happened organically. Again, I don't know why. It, it happened. Then we had some members of the Iowa media. Again, I don't get it. Before the announcement was made, took shots on Tim Lester. Now I'm getting riled up. What is going on here? That guy's got a family. He's got a career. Yeah. And I start looking into them. You know, I'm doing resume searches now to compare. I've got a couple insiders. Okay. They're going to remain, you know, silent everybody was saying it's going to be kevin johns the last podcast we recorded a nebraska fan said oh it's going to be kevin johns no i did not i didn't ever say that because this isn't what i'm hearing i heard that he was a candidate okay and then i have a, another guy that i talked to ex-coach still heavily involved with college football he's telling me behind the scenes man i don't know what's going on but if i'm iowa i hire tim lester this is way closer to what iowa should be doing and this is a better fit i'll be honest in our conversations, he's an X's and O's guy beyond what I can say. He started convincing me. The deeper I looked into it, I'm like, I get it now. T tight end usage, just tight end usage alone, if you bore down into it, would have been a drastic change 
for for Iowa with, with going with Kevin Johns. Did you watch the NFC Championship? Because it looked like Sam Laporta and George Kittle were making a lot of plays for both of their teams. I don't want to go away from Iowa's tight ends. Do I think we need to get the ball to the perimeter much better than we have? Absolutely, freaking lutely And I'm hoping, you know, uh, 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 Tim Lester can do that, okay? He's cer- certainly shown that in his time. And then, so the fit thing is a huge part of it. Then the last thing I would put out there is trying to do at least a little bit of dig on the stats. People have only looked at, for whatever reason, Syracuse, Syracuse, Syracuse. So here's two things. The position that that Tim Laster was brought in at Syracuse was dubious at best. He was brought in as a quarterback's coach, fired the offensive coordinator halfway through the season, and then he was named offensive coordinator. Please give me all of the examples of when a firing of an O coordinator or D coordinator midseason has drastically worked out for anybody. Then he was brought in back in the next year, lame duck coach. Everybody knew it. That's the situation at Syracuse. Again, people that write for this stuff for a living do five consecutive minutes of homework on this. Then you look at what he did at Western Michigan, okay? The offenses, he gets there at 2017, 78th, next year, 35th, next year, 25th, next year, 16th, next year, 12th. That is total offense each year. They got better each and every single year as he worked his way into the program as head coach and offensive coordinator, chief play caller. Last year of his deal, they completely fall apart. This is what happens with G5 teams. When you lose dudes, you're screwed. You don't have any way to replace them in the transfer portal. You are the transfer portal, okay? You give the guys out. You have to build them back. He gets canned. That's the end of his time. Goes to the Packers as as a quality assistant. The only people, only things that people are looking at are his times at Syracuse and his last year at Western Men. Lazy reporting, folks. I'm not saying that he's going to be amazing. I'm saying look at the facts on what is available on the internet. It's a whole it's a whole world out there, folks. Just get on Wikipedia or do some searches and you can find this stuff. Okay. I'm off. Yeah. I'm off my yeah. box. No, you're good. And 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 I dug into, you know, him a little bit. And, you know, he's a great developer. He, he's really good at developing. Um, and and I heard somebody mention that he's really good at developing, or he's he's been successful at developing quarterbacks as well. And so you know, I haven't really looked too much into the quarterback aspect of it, but I do know I have seen, you know, his development and just looking in and reading some of the stuff on his past. Um, but do you think that that is one of the biggest things that Iowa saw in him? And at the same time, on the other side of the of the token, do you think that this style of what Kirk Ferentz wants, do you think the demise is going to just be that ability to not, you know, not steer away from what they know, you know, not venturing yeah. out of that comfort zone that they, that is Iowa. hundred percent. I mean, appropriate question. I don't know the answer to that question to take the, the first one, as far as what KF saw, you know, he hasn't even announced it yet. So hopefully he maybe clues us in a little bit yeah. when it's announced and there's a press conference or whatnot. Um, uh, I would say fit in the, in the uh, staff was huge. For, yeah. for Kirk Ferentz. And again, this is more on Iowa fans. I would say a lot of fans seem to be poo-pooing the whole culture fit thing. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a poo-poo thing. Okay, I hear every coach, including Matt Rule, who's huge on culture, as he should be. It's culture is what him. had it. Yes, it, 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 he turned two pro- – he had to change the culture in yeah. two programs. He was successful doing it. Yep. He's trying to do the same thing at Nebraska. He preaches the same thing. Once you yep. have that culture set, you don't want to you don't want to upset the apple cart. So I don't think bringing somebody in that fits the culture is a nothing burger. So I know Kirk Ferentz had to feel good about that, I, and I think you know he has that with with Lester. There's actually uh, some Hawkeye sleuths out there found a video of him from like after we played Western Michigan in like 2019, where or after he he they threw out that he had already he was kind of handing out some flyers or flowers, excuse me. To, to Lester after they fired him. He basically, they basically said, I don't know why they fired that guy. He was a heck of a coach. And so that's yeah. long before, you know, so Kirk Ferentz has obviously thought about it. 
then obviously how does this blend in to move forward? That's where the, I don't know portion of my answer comes from. What I'm hoping is that it blends in with a lot of stuff that we're doing. I would adapted and had more hat on hat pin and pull blocking from their offensive line last year, which I love to see. Don't want to completely go away from zone blocking, but I don't want zone blocking 9.99% of the time like we have in the past. So I'm hoping that they're keeping that development with the offensive line, bringing in Caden Proctor, which helps now possibly the whole offensive line, if not just for at least two spots. And then we bring in what I hope to see from Tim Lester, which is, you know, and as far as the boxes with Tim Lester, is this all, I wanted a younger, youngish guy. He's older than me. I like to point out, Sonny, we were talking about age before the podcast. <laughs> I, I want a younger guy with experience playing or coaching quarterbacks, a college guy, and then an important thing, embracing mobile quarterbacks. He's got yeah. four check marks there on all of those yeah. things. So mixing in, uh, influencing, you know, crazy things like influencing the safeties, you know, bringing people into the box and exploiting that to the to the yeah. perimeter rpos things that now yeah. iowa fans i believe because justin you seem to be nodding your head these things are starting to leak out that maybe tim lester 15 year coaching experience tim lester isn't a complete buffoon maybe he's actually figured a couple things out iowa fans are are starting to see it by the way i can show you i can show you a screenshot of a text that i i put out a week ago and i said i'm going to predict how this is all going to go i'm at I'm at number three right now in, in my prediction. Yep. We went through one and two really quick. This stuff's easy to see. Yep. Four, four, five, and six with the final being right before the football season starts, Iowa fans will have worked themselves into a lather. We will convince ourselves we're going 12-0 and 0 and getting the Big Ten Championship because that's 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 how she goes. That's how it has to work. And just, uh, Sonny, before your next question, just one thing I wanted to throw out there just to double down on your culture thing. Culture is literally everything. That, that to me, is the foundation for the entire athletic department. That has been one of Nebraska's biggest demise, especially under the Scott Frost era. And, and so, to your point, you can really, if we talk about you know being safe and being the comfort zone, that's a comfort zone for a reason because one decision, one wrong decision can spiral all that out of control. It's, it's about messaging across the entirety of the coaching staff what that does is it helps with recruiting because they know each player knows I'm getting the same messaging across the board no matter who I speak to. Kirk Ferentz knows that everybody out there is recruiting, you know, based on his principles. It's also going to help retain players, you know, during portal season because they know that everything that they were told is exactly what they're getting. So, yeah, culture is everything. And, and especially with, with Iowa, you know, Iowa, for what it's worth, as, as bad as they've been offensively, they have built a culture of like, no, we, we're we winning. Like, we are winners. We're going to find a way to win these games. And so that's all culture right there because Nebraska has the complete opposite. It's like, we're going to find a way to lose these games. And that's that's rampant throughout the minds of those players and in that in that locker room. So, yeah, that can't yep. be understated. And I'm just going to It's all of that. It Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sonny. No, I was going to say, I'm just going to agree with what, what uh, both of you guys are saying. You know, Brett, when he took over at Illinois – um, there was no culture under Lovey Smith. He stopped recruiting. He, uh, the state of Illinois, and you know, since Brett has come in, um, he's talked about you know, as you know, Je Jeff is going to know. Like they, I think they beat us like sixty three nothing or something like that in one of the games uh, that Lovey played uh, was coaching. With Brett, we've had a lot closer games. Like you know, we're still we're five seven eight and five five and seven, but that's a drastic improvement on what Lovey was doing. And Brett talks about like a lot of the close games that we're losing, including I think he talked about uh, this past year to Iowa where, you know, Illinois was up with like four minutes left. He talked about how he's got to build the, the, the locker room is so used to one sort of feeling, one sort of, you know, expectation of giving it away. He's got to take that extra step to change the culture around to be able to, you know, close those games out. And, you know, obviously that comes from the head guy. The head man and you know all three of us at least in my opinion you know have the right guy in charge who recognizes that and you know, they're going to work yep. absolutely yeah. and and i'm proud of you guys for recognizing that um i boy do i hear a lot of podcasters like scoff at this yep. as if we're the dumb ones i don't know if you guys have yep. ever picked up on that to them it's just 100 talent acquisition and that's it 
of course, that is probably the number one. But to yep. askew uh, a locker room, you know, believe it in yourself, feel culture along with schemes. Obviously, yeah. this is coaching. These all of these things yeah. factor in and are, are a huge part of, of the success of a program. Now, yeah, those two, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. You know, one, both can be true. And I think I think one of them is important. Of course, talent acquisition is important in regards to getting your team, you know, to be good on the surface and building a good foundation. But, you know, the the culture matters and everything else beyond that. The next four years, the rest of their career, is, that determines who they become. So, yep, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Speaking of uh, culture and talent acquisition, you know, uh, when Caden Proctor decided to come back, to Iowa City, he talked about how he was, uh, you know, a little homesick. And during his struggles, you know, folks at Iowa, um, you know, kind of reached out to him and checked in on him talking. I'm, I'm being very careful. I'm not saying the wrong. No, I said, uh, you know, yeah, I'm not saying they did anything illegal. But um, and he, he just talked about, you know, how he had visited Iowa constantly. There was a lot of family there, a lot of people he kept in touch with um, up at Iowa. What was it like? How excited were you guys when you know the number one prospect uh, a year ago decided to come back home? The first thing I would say is, uh, as far as you know, the communication. I think every coach and and intelligent fans know to not throw stones in a glass house with that. Uh, then yeah. the other thing I would say is, what is that level? Because you know, there's a guy on Iowa's football team that was high school teammates. If he's texting his buddy, that's not tampering. No, okay, no, that's no. that's just two buddies texting each other. It's a that stuff happens yeah. all the time. My all, gosh, I mean, this all, is happening all everywhere. the time. Yeah. So, like, there is no way to stop this. So, it's just one thing I would put yeah. out there. There. So, um, and as far as Caden Proctor, um, I am I am uh, semi famously tried not to pat myself on the back here. A a uh, curmudgeon when it comes to recruiting in that. You know, at my time at Iowa, I saw guys come in that were supposed to be amazing. And I'm like, the, the term now is Jag. You know, he's just another guy. Um, and then I saw guys that were, that you didn't know anything, like Bob Sanders. Nobody knew who Bob Sanders was when he came in. They knew him by the first scrimmage who Bob Sanders was. So that's always my thoughts with recruiting. So I don't get ton excited, but it's a little bit different when it's Proctor because we saw what he did when the bullets are flying at Alabama. And um, I was a little bit concerned with stuff, you know, that I had heard and seen at the beginning of the year. But then I did my own research and started digging into stuff. And, you know, I, I don't mean that pro football focus is the end all beat all. But by the last four or five games of the year, he was a much more improved left tackle. So I think we get a more polished player that's coming in to play the position. I don't want to, you know just besmirch the guys that are already there, but it, it's going to be hard to beat him out for the position, you know, and, and come. So me, I, I would think he would probably be a starter pretty. And then, you know, our tackle moves down to guard, all the fun stuff that you're hoping to get out of it. And then the offensive line improves. So it's, it's pretty exciting, but he's got to get here, stay healthy, all those things. So uh, I'm just, I'll, just adds up. I'm going to pop out and back in my camera's messing up. But one thing I will say though, on the Proctor stuff, I watched that video that people were talking about, and nowhere in that video did he say they reached out during the season. He Correct. said he they reached out even though he was struggling, which also could have meant after the season. Secondly, 100%. there's so many loopholes. Like for instance, Dylan Raiola coming out because his uh you know uncle lives out there and doing an a, an unofficial quote unquote visit, but it's he's going to see family. Yeah, yeah, that that stuff happens literally everywhere. Too too much yep. major more major expense. I, I would go so far as to say if your coaching staff isn't doing things like this, they're yeah. doing their program a disservice. <laughs> they're behind. <laughs> yes. They're, yes. Right. Is yeah. this the nicest assemblance of an Illinois fan, Iowa and Nebraska fan together? Like we're all, this like, is. Not, I mean, I'm thinking about it now. I'm just watching this conversation. Justin's agreeing with you, Jeff, and I'm kind of nodding my head and like, I, I kind of get it. I'm trying to be unbiased on this and, show. I try to be and, unbiased on this show. And I, I like to think it's because, I mean, I'm still getting to know you guys. I I don't think any one of us are evil people. And I think we <laughs> I've, I've got enough data to, to show that we have common sense abilities. And we yeah. actually can understand nuance to things where, you know, 
too high of a percentage of people on Twitter don't seem to share either of those characteristics, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and I, I think I think it's I think it's fun to throw throw banter here and there, but at the same time, like you know, we we do have to be a little bit level headed and rational sometimes, and try to be unbiased. So, and yeah. especially when you know we have you on who who knows your stuff better than we do, you know, it's okay. We can take a jab here and there, but but overall, you know, right. it, it's hard to it's hard to discredit Iowa for anything they've done outside of just the offense, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. Like, Iowa wins yeah. games in a boring way. Their defense yeah. is great. Their special teams under LeVar Woods is great, okay? Our offense yeah. hasn't been. That's Iowa. That's that's Iowa football. Right. I can assure you that, you know, I'm a big supporter, okay, of Iowa football. I, I am I am ready for something different on offense. Even winning games sometimes, it's, it's, it's borderline painful, you know, with some of this stuff. So, like, all of these things are true. Iowa fans get the most, you know, uh, hot under the collar when you when make you fun of the whole program. program. You, know, you know, like, you know, it's like, okay, take the shots at the offense, but the program itself is darn good. And and hearing shots from, let's say, Iowa State fans, it's like, come on, bro. You know, you're Iowa yeah. State. Like, we, we don't have to hear it from from you. Uh, but obviously, we want to see the offense take a step forward and and for, you know, the product that we see on the field to be a little bit more fun and exciting. We'll see. So I am curious, you know, obviously, you know, Caden Proctor will have cost you a pretty penny when it comes to the NIL um, game. Now, obviously, Justin over there, he's, uh, you know, in Nebraska, they're, how do I say this, um, the spenders when it comes to the NIL game. You know, they're, they're the, that's a community who really wants to win very badly. They're very passionate. Whereas, you know, when it comes to football, uh, Illinois does, isn't, I wouldn't say they're, on the bottom part of the big 10, but they're kind of in probably the bottom third uh, when it comes to raising NIL funds, where do you think Iowa stands? Like uh, how, you know, obviously we're reaching a new point, uh, a new, you know, level of college football. It's just changed. And yeah. NIL is a big part of this new landscape. Um, where is Iowa's uh, NIL game uh, in that landscape? Uh, it's funny. Uh, my, Typical co-host, Big Kurt, and I just talked about this. Shout out to Big Kurt and my other podcast yeah. partner, uh, Jordan yeah. Eggleston. Uh, but Kurt and I just talked about this. And he uh, – so we, we were actually talking about Ohio State and their unbelievable ability to retain pretty much everybody except for Marvin Harrison Jr. Obviously, that took a pretty penny to do that. Um, Ryan Day uh, threw out $13 million dollars as the number that he needed to keep his uh, roster intact and recruit guys. My take was he's throwing out a bigger number. I see this in uh, the, my line of work where money is thrown out by, by entities that uh, because they're trying to get a budget pulled together. So if you ask for 13 million, but you get 10 and a half, but you really only needed nine and a half. Well, now you got a million dollars that you actually you know, neat. So like, I wonder if some of that is going on. Kurt took the other st stance. He's like, I think 13 million is too low. He goes, I think it's like twice that to, to keep these guys around. I do not know that that is my official stance. I, I don't, I do not know. Um, I don't know where Iowa ranks. I would essentially just go off common sense, right? Obviously, um, you know, Illinois is the perfect example, to be honest with you. They are more basketball uh, fanatics than, than football. Why? Because they've had more basketball success consistently right. and over the years than, than football. So, um, you know, Nebraska is on the opposite side, obviously, you know, way more of their money is going to football than, than, than basketball. I was kind of, you know, probably closer to the fanatic of, of Illinois basketball, you know, but yeah, we, you know, we like our women's basketball, men's basketball wrestling. But point I'm trying to get at is there is a level there where you can see there are rabid Hawkeye fans. We know that the Swarm uh, uh, took on a ton of money when we just heard Caden Proctor was entering the transfer portal. Right. The, yeah. the, the Swarm beer, I, I don't know. I By the end of the year last year, the tailgate, I mean, just it was just Swarm beer. You know, that's pretty much what everybody was drinking. So, like, all that money's going somewhere, the vodka, yep. all that stuff. So, like... I, I think Iowa does well. How do they rank? I would say definitely top half, probably right around top third, you know, as far as as what they can do. 
but I wouldn't like to stress it. I don't, I don't really know. Yep. Um, I guess the, 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 the wrap up point here, you know, to, to kind of put this all, put a bow on all of this, just in your, you know, in your humble opinion, looking down the road, um, what does this Iowa team look like? What does this move do for Iowa? Let's say five years down the road, you know, next season, and then five years down the road, what is the difference there? Do you believe this, this, uh, is a success? And do you think this puts Iowa, you know, a step above where they were? You're talking the offensive coordinator hire just, or yeah, just NIL or just, in yeah, general. just in okay. general, all of these moves. What what do you think Iowa yeah. looks like in the next few years? What do you think the uh, offense looks like? Do you think this offense is drastically improved over the next you know few seasons because of the move? Yeah, just your. I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to keep a somewhat concise answer because I know Sonny said you'd like to keep this around 30 minutes. Oh, and we're already fine. over, but um, um, go ahead. You know, I I, I in the in the. In the more recent, you know, uh, how things are going to develop, um, it would sure be nice if the offense looked better so that I don't have to hear the same canned, recycled jokes about Iowa's offense over and over yeah. and over. So I would like to see that, okay? If it, it, I don't think it's this simple, but if the if the offense takes a step up and the defense and special teams, you know, stay very close to where they're at, I was going to be a really good team. I, it's like, yeah. you know, as far as NIL, where Iowa spent a ton of their NIL was keeping guys around, which is a yeah. few guys on offense and a boatload of guys on defense, including, you know, two all Americans at linebacker and, and safety, you know, slash corner. So, so th that is, is huge. So I, if, if the offense, like I'm going to see it to believe it. I say it all the time on the podcast, Twitter, I'm saying it now. So like, I need to see the offense take an improvement first, but but if that happens, it's going to be good things. Then yep. what are the what are the things that can you know that mean it going down the road? Obviously, KF is getting long in the tooth. How long does he want to stick around? Pretty convinced he's going to be at the football coach next year. Three years, five years. That's that's getting up there. You know, he's going to be into yeah. his seventies coaching. I I don't know. So that is going to to but but would potentially Iowa finally having success on offense in spite of what you know, Kirk Ferentz has shown, you know, the last three years, does, does yeah. that re reinvigorate him? You know, mm -hmm. does that yeah. then bring in an even higher candidate to be yeah. the head coach because the profile has been lifted, man, there's just too many data points there that we don't know for me to, you know, put a prediction down. I know the data points. I hope it goes, which is Iowa's offense is a lot better next year. The whole program is better the next couple of years. Kirk, Fer Kirk Ferentz is there two, three years, and we roll into a freaking great coach that you know takes us into the, you know, the, the next forty years. Because like I would point out, um, it's not just recently that Iowa's been good. Iowa's been pretty good since Hayden yeah. Fry's been there. Okay, yeah. I mean we're talking forty plus years of being an extremely consistent, consistent football team. Yeah, consistent. So yeah. I've got. I've got history to fall back on 40 years in the past that makes me think the next five to 10 years will be pretty good as well. I like, I like using the last 40 years too. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> makes, I like to go back you to the 1960s because I think that's when <laughs> I really claimed a, a national championship. You know, we, we talk on a pod all the time. Like there's some fans that need to do a little bit of research. Illinois was dang good in the eighties and nineties. It's <laughs> yeah. too. I mean, it's so just it's funny because you know we are, we are who we are now. But realistically, if you think about it, like we have two of the top ten uh, college football players of all time in Grange and Butkus and stuff like that. Yep. But again, it's just a, a really, really long time ago. Yeah. But um, yeah, Jeff. Uh, just to wrap things up, you know, I, uh, of course, I appreciate your Big Ten content, and you know, you're one of my guys on the Hawkeye side who I can actually tolerate uh, following and <laughs> you know, listening to. But there's another avenue which I consider you an expert at. And what I appreciate is that you appreciate aesthetics as much as I do. So, last question. What are the three best jerseys in the Big Ten Conference? Oh, wow. Put me on the spot. Um, listen, I'm... It, now just jerseys can I am I taking the whole am I taking the whole kit in into consideration here or? 
Okay, you know what? L- l- let's rephrase it. You have to watch okay. one game on TV, not for football yes. purposes, but for pure eye candy. Which two okay. teams are uh, on the field? I'm going to go Michigan's homes, almost for sure. As far as who they're playing, I would go Ohio State's roads, um, Penn State road uniforms. I'm going to be more of a traditional guy. Uh, Iowa's road uniforms. Uh, but th- those would be the candidates. Um, I very much like Michigan State's home uniforms. Very, very, very much. The state of Michigan is strong uh, with the uniforms. I have nothing big time against uh, Nebraska or Wisconsin, but they're too similar. And, and the color red uh, oftentimes does not jive with me. But uh, there's a lot of good ones to pick from in the Big Ten. I'll say those. I think you miss out on USC. I love USC's jerseys. Uh, I think no, I think. Gee, well, you know I, what? Be- because I, I forget like about – yeah, yeah. Yeah, the maroon and gold, I think uh, those dark jerseys are some of my favorites and something I'm really looking forward to seeing on my TV on yeah. Saturday night. Uh, if people want to search, go find the uh, Eyes on Big Podcast. We did a uniforms ranking in the offseason last year. I'm guessing around uh, spring or summer. Um we brought in the next four teams. We were very high on USC, very high on UCLA. Shoot, now that I think about it, I'm not even sure if Washington and Oregon, when we did I, that podcast, had been announced yet, now that I think about it. So well, I don't think I, we ranked I, them. I really like, I don't know, I just like, I kind of like the simple aesthetic of Washington's as well. Maybe it's very just much. something. That I really, like it. Yeah. yeah, I really like the simple aesthetic. Um, just just talking in, in general. Like I think I I think I'm more of a traditional type of guy where like the the yes. you know the Texas Longhorns of the world's like the Ohio States, the Michigans like there's just something about those tried and true and historical programs that just is like iconic you know something yes. that Oregon can not replicate with all their 37 different jersey combinations and stuff like I, that. And I like the spectacle that is Oregon. I do. Yeah. I don't want it for my team. Um, I'm exactly. with you, Justin. USC's home kits are are in, incredible. Uh, USC's road uniforms are good, too, especially because they bring the song girls, which, if I'm yeah. being specific, is the greatest uniform <laughs> in all of college football right there with the song girls yep. bring. But there's a lot of strong uniforms. Like for Michigan, for example, I was so proud of them for wearing their typical home uniforms for the Rose Bowl against Alabama. Okay. I, 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 my yeah. nips get hard just thinking about the uniforms in that Rose Bowl. And <laughs> this, you know, set across the mountains in that stadium, absolutely amazing. Didn't like that they did the big game blues uh, against I like Washington. Blue. I, Washington. Maybe, I like the blues. I don't know. I liked them for some reason. I just think it was just me. I, I heard fine. everybody, I I mean, everybody it's, criticizing them, but I don't know why I liked them. I, I don't hate them, but, man, the the – it's just that I like the regular Michigan uniforms with yeah, the maze pants exactly. so well. Uh, but, you know, I, I kind of had an idea they were going to do that. But, you know, and then, of course, Penn State's is the biggest lightning rod. It, it, it oh, seems yeah. to be very rare that somebody is on the fence. They either love or hate them. I am in the love group, Big Kurt, like very strongly in the hate group for, for like Penn them. State's uniforms. I like them. Yeah. Okay. Look at all disagreeing. We're doing. We should do this more often. It just, right. it just agree I all agree the time. Iowa. Yeah. I didn't agree with Iowa's though. Oh, well, Iowa's can't. uniforms are, are good. No, they're, they're <laughs> nice. gonna... Especially you know in those night games, like when the lights are shining off of them. Um, yeah, I'll, like... I'll keep I'll keep Iowa's towards the back. We'll disagree on the uniform rankings. Just, <laughs> Justin gotta, had to get gotta, one disagreement in there. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to put some put them yep. at the bottom somewhere. I can't be this nice. <laughs> So I get it. Right, I like then. I like Nebraska's uniforms too. I just want to I just want to say they're cool. they're they're classic as, as well. I I wish right from the get go Nebraska had a block end or something different than the Netflix end. And obviously, I know Nebraska's Netflix end precedes the Netflix. It's just yeah, too skinny yeah. and doesn't fit in. I don't see that end anywhere except the helmet. And I know it's traditional, but that's the one thing I wish w- historically wasn't there. Then yeah. Nebraska's uniforms as a whole would rocket rocket up my listings. Yeah. I guess for as a Nebraska fan, just growing up with it, like it's just iconic to us. Like it's just such a it's such a uh, a staple of like what we grew up with. You know, it's just 
I think it's one of those things where you're just partial to it as a fan, a little bit of bias. But outside of that, I can see why people are just kind of like, you know, especially that one game. If you're not a fan of the N and the W with the Nebraska Wisconsin, did you remember that one game where they both had those atrocious uniforms where they just slapped Ooh, the big yeah, that didn't work. W yeah. on the front. It was the, right. that was the worst. That and, was the worst I've ever seen. And, and what I find hilarious is so Alvarez obviously with the Nebraska background, right? And then goes yep. to Wisconsin. It was like he said, I don't like that small N, so I'm going to find the biggest freaking W, motion W, and put it on the helmet to go the opposite direction. I've joked for years, and I call it the white hand of Saruman, where he just <laughs> smacks it on the freaking helmets of, of, of you know of the orcs that are going out to fight. That's what their helmets look like to me. So it's funny that their, the, their logo on helmet is so, such opposite ends of the spectrum. I'm actually trying to find it now to see if I can pull this up so uh, people can see what we're talking about here. I actually found it right here. So let me just pull this up and uh, is that, yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. I, uh, Sonny, have you seen these? They're not coming to my attention right now. Okay, cool. You, you'll uh, definitely know, know in just about a second. Oh, Jeez. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and then Nebraska's were yeah. the same thing, just with a big... Uh, in on the yeah, wow. yeah. they were uh, so bad. Yeah, they were really bad. <laughs> that's, absolutely that's just, horrendous. That just shouldn't but, have happened. That just shouldn't have happened. No, right no. So, all right. Uh, uh, well, before we before we get off here, Jeffrey, anything uh, anything for the people before we uh, sign off, or do you just want to kind of uh, retell everybody where they can find you? Yep, yep. Jeffrey the Greek at Jeffrey the Greek on Twitter podcast eyes on big podcasts is pretty everywhere. But the biggest thing is just saying. Thanks for Sonny to reaching out. Justin, great to talk to you again. Love being on the show. Absolutely, man. Uh, it's always a great time talking to you. Appreciate you coming on, and I'm sure we'll have you again, man. So thank you so much for being gracious with your time. So, Sonny, anything before we sign off? Uh, no, not so much. Uh, if you're liking the content, again, you know, your team is coming. Just leave a comment saying you want a, a show on your team, and Justin and I will do our best to oblige. Uh, for now, just hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, help uh little old channels like ours out yep i appreciate it uh we've we've grown pretty quickly over the last few weeks so it's it's all thanks to y'all so i appreciate everybody who's uh reached out commented liked, subscribed and uh if you yeah like you said if you like what we're doing here please consider subscribing so other than that we will see you in our next episode all right peace